this call is now being recorded. Uh, oh, 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 right, right. Hi, hi. I hope you're fine. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm 14, 14 minutes, minutes late. late. I had another interaction, which is a bit weird. But... <coughs> okay, so I'm going to sh share my screen and uh, then maybe we can start. Okay, just see if I can. All right. So I'm not sure if people have uh, any specific questions with regards to what we looked at yesterday. Now, I thought it was very strange that uh, for more than two hours we were discussing Dublin Core. It's something we're not doing right yet. I don't know why, but maybe. Anyway, I don't know if people have uh, specific questions with uh, the metadata scheme that we're using as a case, uh, which is Dublin Core. Uh, specifically, what we looked at, uh, so called. Uh, 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 DC terms, or we look, looked at simple Dublin core and uh, what you felt as what was previously referred as qualified Dublin core reading, um, and we were linking most of our discussion to what uh, what we typically find in, in this library systems like DSpace, for instance, right? Uh, we also looked at an example um, an example workflow um, in terms of how the metadata actually gets to be specified as you are ingesting content in the typical digital library system. Um, so it's this space essentially. Uh, so I don't know if people have specific questions with regards to Dublin Core. Uh, the, if you think about it, the underlining theme in our discussion was centered around those really, uh, those two important aspects of Dublin Core. The fact that it's repeatable, and the, the fact that the elements are repeatable and that the elements are optional, um, all those 15 elements. I, I don't know if there are any questions. No. Or concerns or uh, contributions, nothing. So if there are no questions, then we continue our discussion with um, with uh, just broadly looking at uh, this whole notion of interoperability protocols. Um, and after we just briefly talk about interoperability protocols, we look at another case example of a protocol, one of the most widely used protocols uh, integrated within digital library management systems. And this is the Open Archives Initiatives protocol for metadata harvesting. Uh, but granted, there are a number of protocols out there and to also remind us that, you see these, these, these protocols that we're going to be talking about here, 27, um, these things would be part of service layer of digital libraries, right? So these protocols we're talking about would, would be associated with this layer here. This is important to mention. Because fundamentally what you're doing by making use of those protocols is you're interacting with these digital objects that are stored in the database, right? So the, the, the protocols would actually fall within the And in fact, if you look at this, by the way, uh, OIPMH protocol service, open search, this is a, a protocol as well. SOD is a protocol as well, right? Um, but granted there are a number of other services or protocols that you could have here, right? Maybe as value added services like um, uh, REST for instance, right? So-called REST API is in a, it's called a web service, but it could be viewed as a protocol, 127. Okay, so if there are no questions, then I suppose we will proceed. Uh, I hope people can hear me though. We are eight of us now, nine of us today. Can, can, you, can you hear me? 
yes doc we can yes doc oh, yes. thanks okay thank you very much uh, that's much better i found myself in the past talking to myself but so it turns out that um, this, this whole notion of interoperability by the way is 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 tied to the notion that um these days these web web point two applications or these web applications do not normally work in isolation the same applies to digital library systems it's almost always the case that um, uh, the digital library systems that we set up will need to interact with other external services right so this is where interoperability protocols come into play right it's it's a way it's a set of standards that makes it easier for two separate systems to interact with each other uh, an example that I keep drawing us to was this platform called OATD, for instance, or the Union Catalog. I keep mentioning that OATD and the Union Catalog will periodically harvest metadata from this space or from repositories, ETD repositories, repositories that uh, store ETDs. All of that is possible because of the fact that these platforms are interoperable. They can interact with each other uh, based on internationally recognized standards. Now these standards come in different shapes and forms, um, but they can be linked to those three key functionalities associated with digital libraries. Access to digital objects, management of digital objects, and storage of digital objects, right? Um, there, there are a number of protocols. I mean, we could sit here and uh, and probably talk about about interoperability protocols uh, all day. But what I want to do is, I don't know if I, I have shared this before. If I haven't, I'm, I'm switching to this because uh, I think Hussein has written about this. Um, I'm going to link to this because uh, it helps. I think it's a chapter protocol. It's a chapter. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a book chapter, but it helps. It's, a, it's an easy to, to synthesize book chapter. Mm. I wonder if there's any protocols. Not protocol, interoperability. There we go. So this is a, a, a great, it's a book chapter. Uh, the preprint is available uh, on the, uh, CS subject repository at UCT. I do encourage you to go through that. It's, it's an easy to digest uh, book chapter, but he, part of what he does is he, he talks about um, some, some commonly used protocols in digital library, uh, in digital libraries, right? Although when, when, when you're discussing interoperability protocols, I guess one of the most uh, commonly referred to as, commonly referred to protocols is uh, the, the OIPMH protocol. And that's because for the most part, right, interactivity between systems will typically involve uh, accessing content. It's rarely the case that uh, the protocol would involve you uh, ingesting a new object into a repository, for instance, right? Um, but there are protocols that facilitate doing that, right? Uh, so protocols like SWORD, for instance, will enable you to use an external application to ingest a new object into a digital library or to deposit a new object into a digital library, right? Um, um, in case you're wondering how this, why this would be useful, if you remember uh, at some point, is it yesterday or the day before yesterday, I, I mentioned that uh, some, some software tools like Dispace will have multi-step uh, workflows. Uh, there are people that have done studies that seem to suggest that uh, the complexity of those workflows affects the user experience, you know, when end users are using that, that particular workflow. And so suggestions that have been proposed is, uh, <coughs> excuse me, why not come up with a, a different interface that will be able to deposit content into the same repository, right? And you can do that by making use of uh, a protocol like SWORD, for instance. And I do know of someone who, who wrote extensively about this, I would, I encourage you to just maybe just go through the abstract and uh, let's look at students. Marwan, Marwan, no, no, Marwan, wow, Marwan. 
Uh, I know Mawan did this. Uh, there we go. Uh, although this, the, the case he used was uh, is more specific, like um, open open education resources. Uh, but part of what he, he did in his his MSc dissertation here is uh, work extensively with so-called short protocol. I do encourage you to look at that. Really interesting study. Um, more about protocols here. But key take our point here is that there are a number of interoperability protocols out there. Fundamentally though, what they're used for is to enable, um, enable communication between two separate services or two separate digital library platforms in this case. Right, so some random examples or some common use examples is uh, SRU or search and retrieval via URL. What this does is it enables uh, remote search browsing. So with, with SRU, you do not necessarily have to be accessing the repository for you to search. You can, do, you can perform your search from, from a separate application by making use of this protocol. SRU is uh, integrated within DSpace. At least the last time I checked the version, the last table release of DSpace, it was there. So, so the protocol, like I mentioned, uh, facilitates remote ingestion of content, right? So you can have an external application used to deposit content into a repository. Um, RSS feeds or Atom feeds will enable you to, to be updated when new content has been added to a platform, in this case, a digital library system. Um, your RESTful API will allow you, will, will be incorporated with so-called API endpoints, right? That will enable you to perform a number of different operations, like add content, access specific content. These are all useful things, and uh, these are all useful things and are used depending, depending on what sort of, what sort of uh, functionality you're looking at implementing. RESTful APIs are typically, uh, are typically used when you're interested in building a new external service that is going to interact with, um, that is going to interact with the digital library. Uh, fun fact, last, was that last year? Last year, December, the other, I don't know, last year, December, I think, I was working with a group of students and part of what we were doing is trying to see if we could, if they could implement um, an external application that was able to interact with a DSpace repository using the REST API, right? Uh, most repositories, if you're, if you're curious as to how this REST API looks like, uh, I wonder if, uh, how is that DSpace? Uh, it's going to work, I wonder. Uh, I wonder if the demo, demo, demo this space, REST API. Maybe the demo application has a REST interface. I think it does. Uh, so the thing with, with the REST API is it facilitates what we were, what we refer to as machine to machine interaction, right? Where two separate applications will be interacting with each other to exchange information. I'm trying to see if we can showcase an example using the DSpace. Uh, wow. Using the DSpace demo site API. I, I guess this would be able to do this, be able to help us do this. I hope. Ooh. Now I think my machine is acting up all of a sudden. I think I should close some of these things. I do apologize for the breaking transmission. Let me just close some of these things here. Come on. Sorry about that. Let's see if we can we can look at an example example REST API for a particular DSpace. Boom, there you go. So for your typical in DSpace, the API has a number of endpoints. So if you notice here, the way that I would access collections in DSpace, right, is by if I if I want to just list the number of collection the the collections in DSpace, all I have to do is make use of the collection 
I think it's collections. The collections API, I don't know if you can see this. I just use the collections API, it returns all the dispersed collection, collections in an array. So if I use this URL, right? Boom, I will have the XML encoded, um, XML encoded collections, right? Again, XML at play here, by the way. So fundamentally though, what I would be doing is I would be interacting with this digital library system, in this case, the DSpace instance, remotely, right? Via this API um, API endpoint, and the number of API endpoints here, you can see this. Okay, um, so REST for APIs. And then there's also the so-called uh, OIPMH protocol, which fundamentally is used to harvest metadata from remote uh, digital library systems that implement the protocol. Uh, and it turns out that this is what we are going to use as a case example to see the usefulness of, of interoperability protocols, essentially. Uh, take away point for this slide is that there are a number of protocols, fundamentally what they're used for is to ensure that uh, two separate platforms are inter interoperable, right? So that they're able to exchange information using international standards. I think that someone wants to come in. <clears throat> right. So we, we're just going to quickly uh, go through the OIPMH protocol as a case, like I said. Uh, so the protocol is typically used to, to transfer uh, digital library metadata between archives, right? And it's a very simple protocol that is uh, made up, it's implemented with uh, so-called verbs, there are six verbs, and collectively what these six verbs do is they allow you to access specific type of information associated with a digital library, um, a digital library system, a remote digital library system. <clears throat> um, I'm just going to walk through these and I'll use examples here. So the, the, the identify verb essentially returns information about the remote repository. So if we were to run the identify verb against the UNSA dispersed repository, we would be able to get back <clears throat> information about the UNSA repository, contact information, um, the best URL for the repository. Right, all, all the good stuff. Uh, so, so this is the sort of interface that you get back. And you notice that the way you access the, the way that you access this particular, the way that you interact with this particular protocol makes use of the typical URI, right? If you look at this URI here, same concept that was introduced in, same concept that was introduced in, uh, Web technologies, right? The idea that uh, the idea that uh, this this URL can be broken up into bits and components, right? OI, OI, request verb. There we go. Identify, right? So you can break break up this. The way the protocol works is you can break up the you can break up the, the request that you send out into different components. The host name, right? The resource that you want, right? And of course this resource is accessible using parameters, right? The part of the parameters that you use is the so-called verb. So this key value pair, where the key is the verbs, signifies exactly what sort of information you want. So what we are saying is that you have a verb which is equal to identify, a verb which is equal to uh, get record, a verb which is equal to list record, a verb which is equal to, is it a metadata format or something? A verb which is, which is equal to list identifiers, right? And, and all these different verbs will give back different type of information. This will give you uh, details of the repository, right? And this example just showcases the sort of information you get back. So when you issue this query on the UNSA repository, then you get back information about the 
repository. You notice here the information that we have on the screenshot is the name of the repository, the contact details of the person, of the contact email. If there's a problem with the repository, in case you want to find out information about repository, the identifier of the repository, the naming scheme format that is used, implicit, it's provided here implicitly by showing you a sample identifier associated with the digital object. The version of the protocol implemented by this repository, the date when the repository was registered, right? Um, the mode of deletion, uh, the, the level of detail associated with the dates in the repository. Now, what, what you immediately notice here is that, uh, oh, what you immediately notice here is that uh, information that you get back is different depending on the type of repository that you interact with. We'll go to our able, uh, our able UCT repository and you will notice immediately that the information that we get similar, similar to the user repository with the small little details like repository name is different. Sorry, I have to let someone in. The contact detail is different to the specific email address you need to use to contact, uh, uh, to contact, to reach out to uh, the people responsible for the UCT repository. They, they identify the repository the sample ID. Now, now I want to draw attention to the sample ID here, right? Because this is interesting here. You notice that for the UCT repository, the sample ID points to, it points to the fact that there's a handle that is integrated with this repository. Compare and contrast with uh, what you get back for the UNSA repository where you, you um, oh, where is that thing? Where you, uh, Oh, yeah. Where if you issue the identify verb, you issue the identify verb, you notice that uh, we, we are using the default one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? Anyway, <clears throat> on with it. Uh, so, so in terms of the OIPMH protocol, the identify verb just lists information about the repository. Um, the list metadata formats verb will spit back the different metadata schemes that you can use to encode data that is stored in that repository. By default, the metadata format that is used is typically Dublin Core, but you can change the format based on the list of metadata formats that are implemented by that repository, right? So you find out which metadata formats are implemented with, the, with that repository by issuing the list metadata formats verb. Quite easy, really. All you do is, instead of issuing the uh, identify verb, you will just issue the similar format, really. You list the list metadata format. So essentially, instead of having verb equal to identify, you have verb equal to list metadata format. Right, so much so that when you issue this request on the repository, you get back the, about that, because I have an asterisk at the end, you will get back the metadata formats. So I have a list here, right? I can present information using this, UK ATDDC, QDC. Now some of these more formats I'm not even familiar with. <clears throat> um, but the idea behind this is that once you list, you, you click the list record here, you can literally view the information using that particular scheme, right? <clears throat> you can tell by, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the XML elements here that we are, we are using something that is contrary to, this, to Dublin Core here, right? I just randomly picked on this. I have no idea what this is. Uh, if we wanted to represent this using METS, uh, then we specify METS as the metadata prefix, right? So we can we can harvest information using these different metadata formats, right? I don't know if this is making sense. So this metadata format just uh, 
lists all the different metadata formats that you can use to encode metadata that you're harvesting from the repository. The list set verb uh, spits out the hierarchical structures that have been implemented on that repository. These hierarchical structures conform to, for the case of dispatch, is so-called communities and collections. The, the way that, that you organize objects um, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in, in a digital library that is implemented with an open source platform like this space is you organize them in structures called communities and collections. The communities and collections are loosely tied to structural metadata, right? So you're specifying how exactly you're going to organize, <clears throat> how you're going to organize and present the digital objects, right? So you get a sense of the broad range of sets of those hierarchical structures implemented in the repository by issuing the list sets verb. Again, all you do is you replace the verb, right? The verb, the verb value pair up with the list set. So my says that when you issue this list set verb, you will get back the sets in that repository. Sorry, I keep using the asterisks here. Ooh, I keep using the asterisks. I don't know why I'm doing this, but Oops. I don't know why I keep doing this. So you list the sets in that repository, right? So we know that the Invest of Zambia repository has a total of 82 sets. So there's a set called Africa Digital Health Library. There's a set called Agriculture Sciences. And true to that, if you go to the interface here, you will find the hierarchical structures that are spit out by that protocol. Africa Digital Library, Agricultural Sciences, Engineering, right? So these are the things that will pop up here. So it's it's both the, com the, collect the communities, which will typically be presented on the landing page, and the collections and some collections that you find within here. So if you click in education, for instance, you'll find collections that are mapped onto the departments for the case of UNSA. And they're all here, right? at least somewhere, hopefully adult education, right? And you can tell that there are collections because by default, the way this space works is that uh, the co collections, the collection ID are prefixed by C, co the community IDs are split uh, prefix with this COM underbar, which is community com. Collections are COL. Right? It's just nice to know things, uh, just in case you are interested in, if you're wondering what these are for. The, the other interesting thing here is that the interface I'm accessing here, <clears throat> it, 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 encodes, it encodes this information in a user-friendly manner. But during machine-to-machine -machine interaction, what is actually happening, right? What is actually happening here is the information is in XML format. It's like this, right? It's encoded in XML. Now, I don't know if I can, you know, lint. I hope I, oh, I can't do this. Uh, let me just example this 310.xml. In an ideal case, the, the, the machine to machine interaction works with information that is presented using XML, right? It's, it's all XML. So observe, if I view that file that I just got, uh, that I just created here. This is how the information would be. And it's not still not properly formatted. I only wish I could format this in a rather user-friendly manner. It appears I can't. That's fine. But anyway, this is all XML. Uh, you notice that there are tags here. I don't know if you can see the tags. Uh, if I can just exit this, because it's irritating. Sorry if I can. You know, I wanted to showcase that uh, the, I can't properly format this, but all of these are XML tags, right? I don't know if you can notice what I'm doing here. All of these are XML tags. Request, 
request list set set. I don't know if this is making sense. If you look at these tags here, the way the way they are being presented, you will immediately notice that uh, okay. You immediately notice that uh, these things are encoded in a certain way, right? So you, you can see that um, set. You can literally see that each each particular each particular ooh, each container structure is encoded in a set tag. Each set tag has a set spec, which is the ID, and a set name, which is the name of the collection of the community, right? So during, during the so-called machine-to-machine interaction, this is, this is the sort of structure that you work with, right? But fundamentally, really, uh, depending on the repository that you're querying, you're able to see this set. So observe, if we visit the NDO, this platform, the South African National ETD portal that we mentioned or introduced a while back, the one that collects ETDs from around universities in South Africa, there you can interact with the OIPMH protocol and list the sets here, right? So say, is this request? Web is equal to, uh, we'll, we'll start with identify. I had someone sign, I don't know what that means, but uh, I hope, you know, maybe it's because it's started, right? List sets. And then this is this is what I'm talking about. This is an order. It, it's an order type of. Uh, I guess it's an order version of OIPMH. So there's no user interface. All you have access to is an XML file, right? So we can see that the NETD portal in South Africa has these sets here. There's a set for the Investor of Pretoria, Cape Peninsula Investor of Technology, right? Central Investor of Technology. All of these universities in South Africa, and all of these are mapped onto. They're mapped onto these universities here. And, and so you, you can immediately see that you can selectively extract information by specifying the sets. So I can pull information from here by just filtering out ETDs that are coming from this university, all these 651 ETDs, right? Uh, in part by using the list set verb. Okay. Uh, you also have the list identifier verb. Now what this does is it just lists the IDs of all the digital objects in the repository, in the digital library, right? Uh, and what you immediately realize here is that uh, uh, you, might, you might need, and I don't know if this is the case, but you would need to specify, you would need to specify the metadata prefix you're going to use to extract the identifiers, right? So list identifiers. See this? Uh, I'm, I'm returning the identifiers, right? Uh, and in case you want to, if you want to see exactly how this, this would appear like, uh, in the so-called machine-to-machine interaction, uh, this is what you would have. Oops, sorry about that. I think I need to mask this ampersand. So this is what you would have here, right? So for each ID, and if I can go back to the main one for each id right i just strip out the first couple of identifiers here for each id you will have the hierarchical structure that it belongs to and the unique identifier so again observe if i attempt to uh i guess if i attempt to sort of like uh indent this based on, I hope this will work. If I indent this identifier, boom, this is what I wanted. No, I got the wrong one actually. I wish I'd gotten more. I don't know if you can see what's happening here. Using the list identifier verb, I am just pulling out the identifier, but the identifier is being pulled with corresponding structures where it belongs to. So this ID here, this object with an ID, this belongs to these two collections. Com under bar that, 
ko and a that. So meaning that this ID belongs to this community and this collection. And it makes sense because organization in the Unza D space, organization of digital objects is in, it's in communities and collections. I do apologize, I think someone wants to get in. It's in communities and collections. Observe, using this information extracted using the so-called least identifier verb, you can easily, you can easily figure out which collection this object belongs to by using the least set or least sets verb. If I go to the UNSA repository and I access the least set verb, list sets verb, I can easily check for this ID here, this community here, 289, and discover that 289 is actually a student project research report. So this object here is a capstone project. This, I, the pro, the, this object with this ID is a capstone project report. And you can prove this by going to the interface. And uh, replacing, I guess, replacing this one here with this ID here, 4153. So if I replace the one with the 4153, you will notice that I have access to this which is so-called student, is this a student report, I wonder? It appears it is, I don't know if it was misclassified here, but it appears in this structure. You see this, on these breadcrumbs, this student research report, it is from the School of Agri. Right, so that's the list verb. Essentially what you're doing is you're just, uh, <clears throat> you are, you're pulling metadata, but, but, but you're just pulling the identifiers with the corresponding hierarchical structures that they're associated with. Uh, list, re list records is, is just, um, uh, I guess a more nuanced version of list identifier. In this case, you are extracting uh, metadata elements associated with that particular object, right? So um, what you have instead of just the IDs, list records. What you have instead of just the IDs is you have the descriptive information as well. I don't know if you can see this, but if I say more, that would be much better. You'll notice that each, each one of these records now will have the descriptive metadata as well, DC subject, right? DC title, DC description, which is abstract, um, DC date. And, and if, you, if you pause and, and try and think about this for a second, if you pause and try and think about this for a second, you realize that the way that you use either one of these six verbs, the OIPMH protocol, would be dependent on what you are at attempting to achieve as you're interacting with the remote repository. If you implement a national portal that harvests ETDs from various universities in Zambia, one of the things you'd have to do is interact with the list record verb because you want to get all the metadata records for the ETDs. One of the other things is you'd have to make use of the list set verb to identify which verb in the different repository or to identify which set is used to to store ETDs. I don't know if I'm making sense and that's for repositories where they they use the same repository to house student project reports, ETDs, preprints, uh, OERs, right? So you want to selectively put information you're looking for. Is this making sense? Yes, no? The, the, get verb, the get record verb is used to pull out an individual record from the repository, just one record. And so for you to be able to do that, in addition to in addition to the, um, the verb itself, which is get record, you need to specify the metadata format you want to use to pull out the information, which is why you have the metadata prefix uh, parameter here. And also the identifier associated with the record you're interested in. You will immediately notice here that uh, it is here that it becomes important that you know 
the naming format used for records in the repository. And this takes us back to the identify verb, where you see that the format is represented like this, identifier format is like so. So if I wanted to pull out, um, if I wanted to pull out this record here, the student report, which is, uh, which is here, oh, where is it? It's gone now. But if I wanted to pull out the record that we were looking at, which is, uh, I think it's this one here, I would, I know that the identifier tag that I would have to use, the identifier tag that I would have to use would have to conform to this naming scheme here. And all I would have to do is replace this digital object ID, the unique ID within the, uh, from the context of the repository with, with this ID here, this 4153, right? So I come here and I say 4153. I know this is the identifier. And then, <coughs> and then I, would, I would then construct the, uh, or specify the, uh, there we go. Construct, come up with the URI that I need to use with the get record, including the parameter that conforms to the identifier. The identifier is now this. Including the metadata prefix, right? Is it the metadata prefix or metadata format? Metadata prefix. Yeah, metadata prefix, metadata prefix. In this case, I want to harvest this one record and, and get the metadata using Dublin Core as the metadata prefix. So much so that when I come back to my browser and I specify what I want, I'll be able to get this record. You notice that I just return one record here with this format. And in case the interface is a bit misleading, you can literally see this from the terminal so that you view the machine, the way the machine would actually be able to interpret this information, uh, it would appear like so. So this one record would be pulled like this. This is the metadata that would be associated with that one record that we just pulled. All right, so get record verb, uh, trivial, and it's XML format, right? It looks like this. This is the one record that I just pulled here. And uh, it's, it's obviously not well, it's obviously not well formatted here. So you can uh, format it in such a way that it, it appears uh, in a more user-friendly manner like so. And identifier header to get record, request is get record and the header. I, I don't know if this is uh, making sense, by the way. I hope it is. Uh, we have the header, we have the actual metadata which uh, encapsulates the Dublin core element, right? Um, I can... Dr. P. Hi. Yes. Uh, could you... Could you please talk about the, the list record verb again? Oh yeah, sure, of course. So the list record verb, right? The list record verb lists all the records in the repository, all of them. Observe, I'm on, I'm, we're accessing the user interface. Um, uh, we, we're accessing, we're interacting with the OIPMH uh, data provider from the UNSA repository. If I use the list record verb, you see this, can you see this highlighted number here? It says zero out of a hundred of 5,792 records. What, what this is telling us is that using the list record verb, I have results of all the 5,792 digital objects in the UNSA repository. They're all here. Record number one, the first record, second record, third record, fourth record, fifth record, all the way up to the 5,792nd record. The interesting thing though is, uh, th these are paginated obvious, for you to see the next records, you'd have to use uh, a resumption token. But, but what the list record does essentially is it just lists all the record in the repository, all of them. I don't know if that answers your question. 
Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Uh, of course, it lists them uh, based on, it lists them encoded using the metadata scheme that you have chosen. So you can list them using Dublin Core. You can list them using the, the famous Mac that all, all of you have used before, right? You can list all of the records using ETDMS, right? You can list them using METS, right? So anyways, uh, this is all this record really, um, I suppose. I don't know. Uh, all right, but, but again, remember that we're just looking at the case here where we are, we are, we are looking at the different verbs. So this explains all the six verbs. Uh, and I, I'm guessing you're sitting there and uh, you're thinking, but how, if in case you forgot me, how, how, why is this even useful? Why should we bother, right? Uh, there's a reason why early on I started uh, talking about the union catalog and OATD and national ETD portals. It turns out that for you to implement such portals, one of the protocols you'd have to work with is the OIPMH protocol, right? So you use it to implement so-called downstream federated services, right? Where you, you harvest information or metadata records from different repositories and present that information in one single interface, right? I'll leave it up to you to think of uh, the potential usage, usage scenarios for that, right? Uh, besides these ETD portals, if you are a university like UNSA, which has a number of journals now available, you probably need to present content from those journals somewhere, right? You can take advantage of the OIPMH protocol. You might want to pull some journal articles published in those journals and put them, automatically present them onto the institutional repository and take advantage of the OIPMH protocol. So federated services, right? And, and there's a range of federated services. Um, uh, some of these we've looked at, the so-called uh, database of African thesis and dissertations, which by the way, we were unable to access last time because it appears dead now, right? So ideally what this federated service is supposed to be, is supposed to collect all ETD metadata from universities in Africa, all of them, right? This is the idea behind it. But the, the last time I checked this, there were uh, 29,233 um, <coughs> records. I think someone has a microphone on, oh, maybe you can perhaps mute your microphone. There's a bit of echo. Right, so um, an example of a federated service, national ETD portals, right? Oh, this is a global ETD portal, which is the NBOTD Union Catalog. It collects ETDs from around the world. This is possible by taking advantage of the OIPMH protocol. Um, the global search interface that is used to, to search for ETDs from around the world, which you can access. This is supposed to be search not union, by the way. It takes advantage of uh, the OIPMH protocol as well. Uh, numerous, numerous usages out there, right? These are all known examples of uh, federated services that are popular. OATD, right? It does the same thing as the union catalog, but it has a certain fancy uh, interface where you can visualize, uh, you can visualize information in a certain graphical manner, right? But all of this is possible because information is pulled from, pulled from different repositories using the so-called OIPMH protocol, right? So you can visualize this information in so many different ways. You can look at publications by country, for instance. You can look at uh, publications by, um, this is taking, uh, you can look at publications by region. You can look at publications by a specific region, actually. Uh, I don't know if this still works, but I hope it does. It would be nice to look at the color-coded presentation of ETDs from Africa. It appears this is not working anymore. Um, but anyway, so, but all of this is possible, right? All of this is possible. I, I, I like this a lot, by the way. Uh, I like telling people, in fact, if you visit uh, the office I work from, uh, there's one poster where, <coughs> excuse me, where I highlight the underrepresentation of the African continent it, what this, what this, um, what this tree chart is showing you is uh, the block size represents the number of ETDs coming from the different 
the, the different um, or harvest it from the different continents in the world, right? <laughs> now, Africa, and I know this is not funny, I know, but Africa is here, right? Africa is here. This is quite sad, really, because we know that there are a number of universities from Africa, right? Uh, the number of content from Africa is less than content coming in from the entire, I guess, entire Portugal or something, or the entire of Finland, which is quite sad, really. But anyways, so all of this, all of these downstream services are possible because of the OIPMH protocol, right? Um, but the, the thing here is because you are, for the most part, you harvest metadata, when you want to access the actual content, you actually have to visit the repository itself, right? So if you search through the Union catalog and you find a hit coming from the Invest of Zambia, once you click on the hyperlink, it takes you to the Invest of Zambia repository. And then from there, you can download the bitstream. And this makes sense because there could be copyright restrictions, right, associated with the ETDs. <clears throat> All right. Um, and so again, a potential usage usage scenario besides the federated service here is that um, you can literally uh, decentralize how you manage your repository, right? So if you think that uh, uh, it's a problem that you only have two people in the library that are ingesting content, you can say, why not come up with subject repositories for the different schools and have the schools ingest content on their own? And then the people in the library will just come in and verify that the people are doing the right thing. This will lessen your burden and allow you to focus on the more important things, right? Um, it, also, <clears throat> it could also potentially reduce the backlog of content that you could have. And I'm, I'm thinking about the Invest of Zambia, which has a huge backlog, right? Um, sometime this year, we were working towards a research report for the Invest of Zambia, and one of the things we discovered was that the repository does not have ETDs from last year, from 2019, because there's a huge backlog. Only two people are able to ingest content. It's too much for them, right? Okay, uh, especially that they're not just ingesting ETDs, they're also ingesting things that they're digitizing. There's massive digitization project happening at UNSA, right? So the idea behind these subject repositories is uh, you can come up with the, um, with these repositories in different schools and then synchronize the content to the main institution-wide repository. Um, an example of the subject repository at the Invest of Cape Town, I've been using this a lot, right? So content from here can be synchronized with the main uh, institution-wide repository using the OIPMH protocol. Uh, this is another subject repository at the Invest of Cape Town. It's specific to a research unit called the South Room, right? Southern African Labor and Development Research Unit. You can access it by going to opensoudru.ac.za. Um, again, the content here can be synchronized with, with the institution-wide repository. Uh, we've set up a subject repository uh, for the Department of Library and Information Science at UNSA. And what we do ourselves is uh, we make it relatively easy to pull information that faculty staff have ingested into the institution-wide repository so that Whoever is interested in research that is generated by the department can access that research by going to this central repository. Um, we've gone a step further. We think it's important for us to archive capstone projects or these final year projects that are generated by students. So we, we, we do that by making use of the subject repository. This is a practice that has been discontinued by the institution-wide repository. I'm told there are questions to do with uh, the quality of that work, right? And so they, they paused. Um, the post ingestion of so-called uh, student reports at UNSA. If you go to the student report called Unity, you'll notice that uh, it only has 1,137 reports. And that's because the most recent report was, oh, I see they're still uploading, was from 2015, right? From five years ago, right? So I, 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 if it were up to me, I think this is important content. If you have a group of students that are doing research uh, uh, for a period of about a year, I think that's the sort of work that is worth exposing out there because some of these students actually get to cover or tackle important, important problems affecting Zambia, right? So uh, in my case, I mean, I, I've, I've, I've been a proponent, I've been insisting to colleagues in the department that irrespective of whether they are worried about the quality of the student reports, we should put them out there. Uh, they need to be out there. And in fact, we've interacted with people from entities like CIDAS that 
have found some of the work that we do as a department quite useful, right? But anyway, uh, so subject repositories, right? Um, you could set up national ATD portals, right? Where you're aggregating content from entities from around, the from all over a particular country, right? This doesn't have to be ETDs. It could be research that is generated from around Zambia. We have a ton of, of research institutes, or the agricultural research institutes, and so-called, uh, is it, there's, there's a newly established, uh, is it a nuclear energy institute or some, 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 something to that, to that effect? I mean, well, would be, it would be nice if we we're able to collect all that research output and present it in a unified interface so that whoever is interested in viewing research that is generated in the Republic of Zambia can just go to that interface, right? All that can be made possible by making use of interoperability protocols and OIPMH is a classic for these libraries, right? Um, a ton of countries have done, have done this, South Africa. Um, we are in the process of setting this up. Now this, this port, the prototype port we're sitting on a, on a very delicate server. It's the service is sometimes online, sometimes it's offline, but currently we only have content coming in from, uh, content coming in from CBU and the investor of Zambia. It would be nice if we could have uh, Mulungushi University, Lake Mwanawasa University and all these different universities uh, be able to, I hope it's up and running, probably not actually, it's probably it's offline, it's offline, okay. It would be nice, right, if we could have, um, we could have, if we could have other universities, um, if we could have other universities <coughs> synchronize content from their repositories, right? Let me see if by the time we are done with this, we'll be able to restart the services. No, it usually it takes a bit of time for the services to restart, but maybe by, by before we part ways, this thing will be up and running and then you'll be able to see how the portal looks like. It's, it's a trivial thing. It's not a difficult thing to do, right? You're just interacting with all six webs, really. Um, <clears throat> and the ton of digital library systems that you can use to implement these portals, uh, we've decided to choose to, to use this ETD portal software because I happen to have participated in making changes or developing this piece of software, right? So if you're interested in setting up um, a portal of any sorts uh, at work or maybe experimenting with this, you can clone this. This is open source software that you can use. Um, you can clone this software by going to this link here. Uh, whoa, where is that? Repositories. You can clone this by going to, wow. I guess I have to, I'm logged on here. I would have to. <clears throat> um, these are easy to use tools, by the way, right? I mean, these are things that are not that hard to use, uh, quite trivial, really. Uh, ETD portal software. So if you want to, to, to experiment with ETD portal software, you can clone it. It's available there. Um, It's available there. You can clone it and actually ex experiment with this, install it yourself. You can also, <clears throat> the portal. You can, there's also a screen card. In that repository, there's a manual. Uh, but you can also, uh, hmm. there's also a screen card. I hope it's going to be there, probably not. Oh, there we go. So, no. Oof. Okay, there's, there's supposed to be, there's bound to, there's supposed to be a, supposed to be a screencast. Um, this is quite sad. There's supposed to be a screencast that, uh, that is, that, well, oh, there we go. So there's, there's also this screencast that you can, you can go through to, to, um, to just familiarize yourself with how to set up such a portal. It's quite easy to use, really. If you wanted, actually, you could implement such a portal using this space or ePrints, right? It's one and the same thing because all these systems have features that allow you to create collections, collections that enable you to, to instead of ingesting content using a workflow, 
you configure them in such a way that they are updated depending on whether content in a remote repository has changed. <clears throat> in fact, this is what we've done with our subject repository in the list department. So this, this, collect, this community code query research output has content that we automatically pull from the main UNSA repository. We don't explicitly insert things in here, right? So we take advantage of the OIPMH protocol. Um, again, just to remind us that we are looking at examples of, of uh, usage scenarios of the so-called OIPMH protocol, really. Um, I don't know if uh, this was in terms of uh, interoperability protocols and specifically a case example of the OIPMH protocol. I hope this was uh, uh, clear enough, unless if, uh, if people have specific questions. I will pause before we transition to unit six, which is tools and services associated with digital libraries. By the way, part of the reason why this particular, uh, this particular mode is significantly longer than the others is because some of the things that we get to discuss here, are things that we would, would have otherwise discussed under our integrated library system component, right? So this is why. Any any concerns or comments? Questions? No. Okay. All right. So if that's the case, then uh, we'll proceed to tools and services, right? And so the idea here is just to look at uh, some just some sample. Uh, popular open source digital library software tools and services that are available out there. And we generally focus on open source software tools because you can easily gain access to these and experiment with them. Um, suffice to say that there are commercial tools and services that are available out there, right? Um, but of course, for you to gain access to them, you probably need to, uh, to, to pay a subscription fee or something, or buy a license, right? Um, and, and then we we'll also look at some, some, some things to consider when you are wanting to compare one tool against the other, right? And you'll notice that our focus, in the comparison will be centered around the three layers associated with your typical digital library system. So the user layer, the service layer, and the storage layer. Um, so it turns out that there's, there's really hundreds of, of tools that are very about there. Um, but the, the key thing, the common, the golden thread, when you look at all these tools is that they'll typically be built using the core fundamental concepts that we discussed, right? So the idea behind identifiers and interoperability protocols and international standards, right? <clears throat> uh, the differences would be perhaps in the, um, the user interface, um, on whether the tool is specific to a particular domain whether it's, it's appropriate for a particular type of digital object. But fundamental concepts associated to digital libraries transcend all these different open source digital library tools that we're going to look at. Um, but also, some of these, these tools would be standalone platforms. Uh, some of them would be federated platforms or implemented as cloud-based cloud services that are used to aggregate co content from multiple, multiple sources. <coughs> right? Um, <clears throat> a, a good way of getting an appreciation of, <clears throat> excuse me, the range of tools that are available out there is if you go to the so-called open door, uh, 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 the director of open, open access repositories. And what, what this interface does is, I, I know they were in the process of migrating this, but if you go to that interface, <clears throat> uh, if you go to this interface, open, open door.org, what you will realize is that um, you can gain access to, or you, you, you gain a sense of the range of tools. I think they've changed the interface. You gain access to the range of tools that are available out there. Let's see, maybe statistics. Uh, <clears throat> so you have, oh, this is nice. There's a new interface, they've migrated the interface. You notice here that you have a, a nice graph that shows you the popularity of these tools, right? Now, I guess one of the things that we probably want to mention when we look at the characteristics to look out for when you're evaluating open source software tools is perhaps you can look at popularity. 
Maybe because everyone is buying a Toyota in Zambia means that there's something special about a Toyota, so you buy a Toyota yourself, right? So because 40% of the repositories are powered by this space, according to Open Door, um, then perhaps you are better off using this space, right? Go figure. Um, so this is a nice, I see the interface has changed. I'm going to share this in the link so that people have access to this. Right, so you can go to, to these, these nice web, web services that allow you to, to gain a sense of the popularity of different tools, right? Um, but some, some, some examples here include, uh, some popular examples include Omeka. Um, this, this is typically used to create uh, digital collections, right? Um, and one of the features that are embedded within Omeka that you won't find in other tools uh, the feature associated with exhibits, right, which makes it a prime candidate for, uh, let's say, cultural heritage collections, for instance, right? So if we wanted to create um, a, a heritage collection of the struggle for independence in Zambia, we'd probably be better off using Omeka, right? Um, this, is, this, is, this is a sort of interface that you'd be presented with. This is just an instance of Omeka. It's a Martin West collection. If you go to that link, you'll be able to visit the exhibits, right? Very visually appealing interface. So maybe let's go to wait, Martin West and see how it looks like. Um, I hope it's still there, martinwest.uct.ac.za. Martin West. I hope it's still there. Maybe it died. Oh, it's still here. Uh, this was set up a while back, actually. Uh, it's from the Center for Creating the Archive. Really nice, um, nice uh, way of visualizing, visualizing collections, right? Collections that are made up of images. Um, you notice that there are different exhibits here. Th this is perhaps something that you wouldn't really be able to easily do with, um, and to easily, you from uh, you wouldn't be able to to easily. The exhibit is no longer there. You wouldn't be able to to easily do this with, um, with DSpace or with ePrints because those tools are best, are best, uh, are best used for, for implementing repositories or digital libraries that will fundamentally uh, be housing or storing documents, right? I see the exhibits were gotten rid of here, which is quite unfortunate, but anyways. Um, Cool things in my opinion. <clears throat> okay, so there's Omeka, right? Very easy to use. It's freely available and open source. All you have to do is go here, download it, and then you install it. Very easy to install, I assure you, right? Um, there's also the famous DSpace now, right? And I guess we, we, we don't really have to spend a lot of time here, but if you want to download it, you typically just go here and download it for free and then you can install it. The installation process, it's not as easy as uh, platforms like Omeka. It requires a little bit of extra effort here. You need to know what you're doing, right? Um, but the beauty with in almost all these instances, because they are freely available tools and open source, you can customize them so that they look a certain way. You wouldn't actually know that this is implemented using this space because it has gone extensive, it, it has undergone extensive uh, customization, right? The interface has changed. Um, and true to that, the average DSpace repository that you visit will typically uh, be customized in such a way that it, it looks nothing like the default look and feel. <laughs> Granted, uh, if you are a resource-constrained organization like UNSA, you can just make do with the default look and feel, right? If you look at the look and feel of the DSpace interface at UNSA, you get an appreciation that it looks almost the same as the default DSpace, right? To access the, is it the XML UI interface? You notice that this interface is almost exactly the same as the default interface. It will come up just now. The only difference is what we've done is we've just changed the colors so that they match the UNSA brand, green, the logo here, right? But everything else is pretty much how the default look and feel looks like. But you don't have to do this. You can customize it by making use of the skills that you've generated after we looked at HTML. Because all you're doing when you're customizing is you're changing, you're changing the HTML, right? So that it looks fancy, like this. So that it looks like a university 
of Pretoria, this space. So it, it looks like, like, like this, for instance, right? Well, you wouldn't know that it's this space because it's undergone extensive customization. Very easy to do. It's not that hard. Um, right, so this space, Turns out that there's more. There's also e-prints, right? Again, it's similar to this space, this is appropriate for documents, document archives. Uh, an example that I'm familiar with is a subject repository for the computer science department at the University of Cape Town. This is how it looks like. Simple interface, but again, you can customize it so that it looks uh, much more visually appealing than the vanilla user interface that you have access to. There are also platforms that are meant for handling uh, relatively large collections, right? Uh, so there's tools like Fedora Commons, for instance. Uh, I'm gonna pause, I think there's someone who wants to get in. There are tools like Fedora Commons, right? Um, the, the, the only drawback with Fedora Commons is that um, it's, it's literally, it's, it's a repository platform. And so it doesn't come with a user interface readily available. You'd have to implement the user interface yourself which is why there are platforms like, uh, I don't know if it's Faze or Islandora, for instance. Uh, so if you look up Islandora, uh, Islandora, you should be able to, Islandora is, is built on top of uh, Fedora Commons. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it, it, it actually provides you with an out of the box platform built on top of Fedora Commons, right? So if you you don't have the manpower to, to implement a nice interface, you can just download, um, you can download Islandora, right? <coughs> Good stuff, I think. Anyway, uh, um, and then on the extreme end, you have tools like Greenstone. This was quite popular because it had the backing of UNESCO. Um, it, it was, it actually, it, the project itself had support from UNESCO and the idea behind Greenstone was um, to make it possible for environments where internet connectivity was problematic to be able to deploy collections, right? And so there, was, uh, th there were nifty features that made it possible for you to export heritage collections that could be stored on a read-only CD, right? So those CD on drives, but that's no longer the case. But it's still a useful, <coughs> I guess, a useful software tool to look at, right? So the question to ask though is, is what, what sort of things, right? What sort of things would you have to look at in the event that you're faced with a situation either at work or whatever situation you're faced, where you have to decide on whether you should go for Omeka, Fedora Commons, uh, or DSpace, or, or FaZe, um, or Islandora, right? Um, question is, what, what would you have to look out for? Well, it turns out that uh, there are people that have actually done extensive uh, research. They've, look at, they've looked into things to look at, um, if, if you're wanting to to, uh, to 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 come up with a very informed way of deciding which sort of platform you'd want to you'd want to adopt, right? <clears throat> uh, I do encourage you to read up on this this paper. It's quite odd, but uh, the, the ideas presented there are still useful nonetheless. Um, that, so in this approach, uh, this is a multifaceted approach where um, these authors looked at, at at different aspects of digital libraries. But there are also users that have looked at uh, digital libraries from the perspective of usability, right? So how usable are the platforms? Are they user friendly, right? So if you install Omeka, if you install Greenstone, is it more user friendly or more usable than Fedora Commons or than ePrints, right? Um, so you can look at it from the end user perspective where you look at the usability, which is what they did here. Um, as part of my master's, what I did was, um, this is I think in chapter chapter two, um, I came up with a matrix where the focus was on, on the storage layer, the service layer, and the features that were unique to the different platforms that we, we evaluated here, right? So uh, based on this, and this is a precursor to what we are proposing, right? this idea behind simple digital libraries. But the, the key thing here is that there's different ways of evaluating digital library uh, tools and services, but it all boils down to the three layers, right? User layer, service layer, and the storage layer, right? So typical things to look at here is uh, issues to do with 
how easy it would be for you to set up the open source tool. Is, 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 is the setup process, the setup and configuration process time consuming? Does it require that you have expertise in a certain area? Are the prerequisite components very difficult to install? This is the case for DSpace, by the way. You'd have to know exactly what you're doing, right? Um, because you have to set up the database beforehand. Uh, typically, the default database is uh, PostgreSQL. Uh, you'd have to install software components like Ant, for instance, and Marvin, because you build it online, right? Uh, but with Omeka, you just download it, and then it's like, it's like WordPress, next, 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 next. The other things to look at here is um, once you set up this repository, does it require an expert for it to be administered and maintained, right? In case there's a problem, in case there's an upgrade that is required, does it require a lot of uh, expertise, right? Someone with, with, with sufficient expertise. Um, you, could, you could also look at it from the perspective of, uh, uh, I guess, whether or not the user interface is, uh, is more user-friendly, right? More visually appealing, perhaps. Um, so there's different ways of looking at this, but also things like uh, the support for workflows, right? So once you set up this portal, and end users uh, start interacting with the, the repository, is the ingestion process itself easy enough such that there's things like workflows integrated within the ingestion process? What about the support for naming schemes, right? Is the repository able to be integrated with these various um, services that are available? Handles, DOIs, right? uh, PUR, PURLs. <clears throat> these are different things to look at. Um, in terms of services, you could ask yourself questions like um, whether complex relationships between the different objects in the repository can easily be modeled by the, by the repository software, by the digital library software. Is it possible for you to extend the functionality of the platform? This is almost always the case for free and open source software tools. But then in certain instances, the ex extensibility might not really be that intuitive, right? Uh, the beauty with extensibility is uh, if you're a large organization like UNSA or CB or Liverpool National University, you will typically have a dedicated IT department which has people that develop software or that modify software. So if you want a certain feature implemented for this space, you can just reach out to, you can reach out to um, IT department and tell them to say, oh, we want this sort of plugin, right? This space is so easy to extend such that there are a ton of people that have implemented, um, that have implemented plugins, right? So if you go to platforms like this space, the support. Uh, there's there's a there's a there's a wiki page. It's supposed to be a wiki page which lists all the different plugins that have been implemented. The organizations like uh, Admire that develop plugins uh, and sell them commercial versions of plugins, right? Um, ooh, Admire this place. <clears throat> um, you know so. This space happens to be quite easy to extend, by the way. All you have to do is know how to, uh, depending on what sort of ex extensibility you are looking at implementing, you would, uh, actually, wow. Oh, there we go, I was getting lost there. Depending on what sort of functionality you would want, um, you can easily extend these things. All right, All right. but the, the key thing here is we're looking at, uh, Features to look out for when you're evaluating one digital library software against the other, right? When you're wanting to decide what you want. So if you haven't set up a repository at work and you're, ask, you're thinking to yourself, which repository should we use? Don't just go with the crowd and say, we are going to use this space because uh, according to Open Door or the Shepa website, 40%, 40% of uh, repositories that have been surveyed use, uh, oof, According to this portal, 30% of, wow, it's gone. Anyway, I thought I had it there. Uh, according, to, according to this thing, 40% of 
40% of repositories use this space, so we must also use this space. I don't think that's a nice way of doing this. I mean, you should buy a Corolla because you've done your research and you, you've realized that maybe fuel efficiency is top notch for a Corolla, right? So that's, that's a good enough justification, not just buying it because everybody's buying a Corolla. But maybe, maybe not, you know. Um, right, so extensibility, platform support, can you install it on different operating systems? Or is it, is it that uh, you can only install it on a Unix operating system or Windows-based operating system? What sort of web services are integrated or incorporated within the digital library software? And web services here could be linked to protocols, right? Is OIPMH implemented? Is REST implemented? Is SWORD implemented, right? Uh, support for unique identifiers. These are all different things to look at, but also, um, you might want to look at it from the perspective of the storage layer itself. Are you able to store complex digital objects? Or can you just uh, store very simple objects like just images, for instance, or uh, documents, right? Um, how are the objects organized? Is it that uh, you need a separate software tool like a database to store metadata, right? Um, or could it be that you have to store everything into a database or something? These are all different things that you, you'd really want to look at as you're evaluating these open source tools, right? Uh, right, a quick run, that was just a quick rundown of uh, different open source software tools that are available out there. Um, I'm gonna pause and uh, see if there are questions here. It would be nice if we had some sort of a conversation around this, right? Uh, Are there any questions? I lost connection, I wonder. Maybe I have, actually. Oh, I see I'm still online. Okay, D do you have any questions, by the way, or is this making sense? Mr. Celia, is this making sense or is this not uh, a bit confusing or something? Here's another way of looking at it. It is, oh. it is making sense, though. Okay, here's another thing, right? Our colleague from, uh, <laughs> from CBU, do you know if you underwent a certain systematic process to decide uh, to decide to say, now this is CBU now, right? <laughs> decide to say at CBU, we want to use this space right Oof. I wonder what it's called now is this even this space CBO did you know if uh JSPUI I didn't know this okay did is there did you go did you are you, were you involved in are you involved with the repository um uh what I can say is uh there are I work in the special collections. Yes. Yes, and uh, one of the projects that uh, we are developing is an institution repository. But I'm oh. not uh, like I'm not involved per se. The yeah. um, yes, there is uh, a gentleman who's uh, who has skills like already the skills that are identified. You know, IT skills that are already identified by the department is the yes. one to 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 do to process to do to work with the uh, institution repository so now that I'm, I'm getting some ideas I want to to go and uh, like see what he's doing and uh, if I I would uh, if I would find uh, if I would see that it's, it's, it's there's something that I've according to what I've uh, uh, learned here is not doing right then I can advise or right Maybe I can bring it up to you know for the discussion in this uh, in this group. Right, right. Yeah, I mean it's um yeah so, it's uh, I, I I really love to to get involved into what is done is because uh, you know the there are these skills that uh, the department identifies uh, that people have and they say this one is is good at this this one is good at this so this is the gentleman who is specifically under institution repository. So now, if at all, I have 
skills. If I can gain skills, enough skills, as we are learning or doing these instructions, and I present it to, to my department, I think I can be incorporated to, to like work together and, and uh, proceed and uh, with the institution project that I've been working on. Yeah, I mean, I've always wondered why, and I've mentioned this when I attend events, um, in events where there are people from CBU. I always ask, what happened to CBU? If you notice, I just, if you notice, the last content mm -hmm. uploaded here mm -hmm. was in 2011, right? So I've always, I've often wondered why, right? But, yes. Uh, and there's I only 168 objects in the yes. CBU repository. The major problem is the infrastructure. You know, okay. we do have problems, especially where hardware is concerned. Because before the, the, the book or information resources are uploaded onto the institution repository, which has to be digitized. So the, 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 the machine has broken down. Since I came back from school, because I completed it in 2014, when yeah. I was an undergraduate, I found that that's the time I think I found that they had, even the machine had already broken. So we only have those documents that were done, I think, before, before 20, 2014. And uh, I think it's just the, the support, you know, the leadership. You are not getting enough support from the leadership. Yeah. And also from the, the schools. They are, these lecturers, they are skeptical of depositing their intellectual you know, works, you know, to the library. Right. I, I don't know. I don't know the problem. I don't know what what is the problem, really. That's that's a, that's, that's interesting. I've interacted with uh, a lot of people that are that I know wouldn't even be skeptical. Like I know George, that would not be George Moore. <laughs> like you, know. like you mentioned in the discussion, you were yes. saying when the undergraduate do these, uh, you know, research projects, even if they are not of quality. If you know yeah. you follow the, the content, I'm sure there is also that uh, uh, they are skeptical of maybe bringing out their, their, the, the projects of the final year because maybe they know that because they supervise them, maybe their credibility will be questioned if at all they are brought into the, you know, on, onto the institution repository because everyone will see what they have done and then they'll question even the supervisor especially if they are not done done according to quality, then who supervise? So I'm sure there is all, all those things are involved and also plagiarism and you know, but again, we have the intellectual property policy. So I, I, I really wonder why it hasn't uh, really implemented and developed. Yeah, I mean, so one of looking at this, right, is like if, if you are, if you are, I don't know which entity in the library at CBA is responsible for this, is you can take it up as a challenge yourself and try and see if you can gradually start building some sort of traction in here so that whatever little content you have access to, and these days most of the content is actually born digital, right? Mm -hmm. So even if the machine is broken down, but content that is currently being generated, like uh, I know I'm examining students at CBU, yes. those things are not going to be scanned in any way. These are going to be born digital, um, these are going to be born digital uh, objects, right? So I'm sure the directorate which is responsible Responsible, the department or entity responsible for postgraduates probably has some policy in place that mandates all graduating students to submit some documents somewhere. You can start with that, right? It's low hanging fruit. This is a problem that the UNSA has, by the way. If you look at the UNSA, I keep mentioning this. There's a reason why I keep drawing people's attention to the problem with the UNSA repository. It makes no sense that there's one publication from engineering, but that's fine. We know that if we go to Thesis and dissertations, DRIGS has a policy in place that ensures that all dissertations coming from engineering, whoever graduates, they're going to deposit in here. And, and with this, at least, we were able to save face and ensure that there's some content that is ingested into the repository. But also, something that has helped us, and I, I guess this is something that is outside the, the scope of what the library does, is the, the newly introduced promotion criteria at UNSA. For you to be promoted now, they look at what they call uh, the H index, right? Uh, so they will look at what, what they call the H index. Um, so, so much as that uh, uh, before you are promoted, they look at this metric. Now, the thing with this metric is that part of, part of how 
you are able to increase this metric here, the seven that Dr. Kandelo has here, is if you make available your research output online, right? And an easier way of making available research output online is just by depositing it into the institutional repository. But not only that, right? People don't realize that uh, the, 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 uh, the what, what's the word again? The reputation of the university is linked to the availability of resources that you make available online, right? Um, so, so this is, and I don't know if people think about this, but if you start looking at these crazy numbers, now I, I know it's about metrics, but if you start looking at these crazy numbers, people don't realize that these crazy numbers that you see here are in part because there's literally little visibility of research online, right? This is why we have universities that are ranked 5,000, 2,000, 11,000, right? So now I, I don't know, I, I mean, it's a, it's a thing. I, I, I always remind people that uh, when you go out there, right, and you tell people, and I know a lot of you in here have visited places, you tell people I'm from the University of Zambia, the Copper Belt University, or Lenkmo and Awesome Medical University. You know what people do these days? Google, right? You Google up and you find, oh, this guy comes from the university which ranks number 2000. Okay. You know, but I'm just saying, right, you're not as good as, uh, as the weakest link. But these are things to think about. And, and I, my hope has always been that <clears throat> when we're having these interactions, these are the sort of things we should be thinking about beyond, beyond just uh, uh, writing the exam and passing the course, right? What can we do better at work? Now I've interacted by, uh, by uh, our colleague from, I don't know if she's here today from, um, is it Mbala? St. Mary's College of Education. She's gone now, I think. I think she's gone. She's family or something. Um, but I know that what they, what they do is they, they the, the approach they've taken is they just use the repository to make available content on the local area network, right? So on their extra net. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I hope I hope this is useful enough, useful information. Uh, any any other thoughts on this? Um, hello. Yes. Yes. Um, okay, this is Euphrasia. My own. Oh, yes. I want to share my own experience. Um, I, I find this lesson to be very beneficial on my end because I'm working in a library that is uh, just moving from a college status to a university status and it happens that I am the li librarian and I have to implement all these things because like I have to begin from scratch. There was completely like nothing. So at the point when I was thinking of implementing an institutional repository, I had to engage the IT uh, guys uh, purely because I didn't know how to go about it. So one thing that I got from there was that I, was, I thought it was a much complicated case. But now after this lesson, I realized that these are just open softwares that probably maybe need a bit of skills here and there for you to manage them. So it happens that even the persons that I was trying to engage, from my conclusion now, I can say that probably maybe they were also not fully uh, informed about what was supposed to be done because they were telling me, no, we have to consult the people that are uh, hosting us for the website so that they could grant us space and all those things. I don't where know is, if there is any education. Sorry? Remind me again, where is WIC? Uh, Talimbana University. Yeah, but Salima, did you join us for that uh, workshop we held? Were you there? Or it was just the people uh, from IT? I think it was just people from IT. I yes, remember I there was that. someone from Chalimbana and uh, one of the outcomes was that they were going to implement this. Here's the thing, right? And if you want, we okay. can take this offline. Actually, I can provide you with more details. And for those of you that yes, are not aware, have you, have, you, oh, yes. have you heard of Zamrin? Anybody heard of Zamrin? Yes, I, yes, I have. Part of what Zamrin does is they provide you with free hosting space as an institution. They have plenty of space. And what Zamrin has been doing is they've been complaining that, that institutions of higher learning are not making use of the resources that they have available. Uh, so okay. our, 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 our journal, for instance, our departmental journal, the Zajlis uh, journal, for instance, mm -hmm. this is hosted on Zamrin servers. Free hosting space. Oh, okay. You know, so, yeah, I mean, so, so these are, 
but I, I guess maybe it's uh, I don't know who hosts the Charimbana server, but but you can go the Zambian route, which is a reliable okay. platform actually, <laughs> which access for free. In fact, Charimbana already pays money for this, by the way. All the universities. I'd like to think you have Edurom implemented at Charimbana, right? Yes, we do. Yeah, so you automatically have access to these Zambian resources. So so. And I guess it's, it's part of the reason why we deliberately invite people that are working towards implementing this or have implemented this so that they share their experiences or not sort of challenges they've experienced so that you don't experience the same challenges. I do encourage you to please attend the Monday uh, interaction with uh, the Zika's librarian um, okay. because her alongside the deputy librarian are going to talk about mm -hmm. the experiences implementing the repository. And then I think on Wednesday, um, Zachary Zuru from, from the Invest of Zambia, who for years manned the Invest of Zambia Institution Repository, is going to come in and give a talk centered on, around that. And I think our fo his focus is probably going to touch a bit more on um, coming up with policy, right? Because like I keep stressing, the technology, right? This thing, this thing you're calling the repository, you can actually set it up in, in one, well, if you just read up on the money, in one day, one weekend, right? But, but the, the problem, the problem is this, uh, where are we now? The problem is what, what I was, we were discussing with Harriet, right? The, pro the problem is, uh, the, the, the problem is, uh, is this. Uh, the problem is this, right? Where you have instances where content was last uploaded in 2011. Infrastructure is there, but we know it's there because we can access the repository, right? But because there's no explicit policy, to force people to upload content in here. And this thing is, it's, it's been dormant for nine years now, right? And you only have uh, 186 content in the repository. We know that this is not indicative of what's going on there, right? So, so yeah, I mean, uh, both both uh, Zachary, myself, and, and, and Abdo are very keen to help wherever we can. Part of the reason why we, we organized that workshop, by the way, which it's unfortunate that you missed is because it was we're trying to set the stage on how we can start working together with colleagues elsewhere, right? So that we, we move forward, I guess. Uh, so, yeah. Any other thoughts or experiences? Uh, hello, Doc. Yes, hi. Yes. Is there, without uh, the digitization process, Yes. Is there any other way we can get uh, the information resources and upload them into institution repository? Yes, you come up with the policy. And your starting point, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Please attend Zachary's talk on Wednesday. Your starting point is, if your unit, you say you work in the special collections, our mm -hmm. special collections, I think, is involved in the IR to a certain extent. Sure. But if you're somewhat involved with the repository, your starting point should be request or ask if you can be given access to this repository. Right, okay. because clearly there is part of the reason why content was last uploaded in 2011 is probably because no one has access to this thing here, I think. So as for access, once you do that, maybe approach your, I don't know if you have the equivalent of a director of uh, uh, research and graduate studies, like uh, our DRGS here, find yes. out okay. if they collect electronic copies of thesis and dissertations, and then ask them to say, is there a reason why you stopped uploading content here because the, their thesis and this thesis for this if you look at the structure for CVU here we can yeah. see that they are co collections associated with thesis and dissertations right yes. so ask if and I'm sure they any normal entity like that will, will probably have electronic copies of those dissertations if they do yes that's, yeah. that's what they've been told that they have to to get a copy in electronic format and another okay. in uh, in a physical format, like the one which is which they submit to the library, and the other one remains in the postgraduate school of postgraduates in electronic format. So, if, if that hasn't yet been done, one way of starting this is, is like I know some libraries have very strong ties with certain schools and departments. Like, for instance, our our library, for obvious reasons has some, some strong ties with our department and our school, right, implicitly. So we always have somebody from the library come through when we have these board of studies meetings, for instance, right? And because of those strong ties, it's very easy to start implementation of some of these ideas, right? So don't think big, start small. Maybe if you have, uh, maybe if you have very strong ties with, uh, 
the Directorate of Dis Distance Education, for instance, go out there, I'm sure you have relationships with certain specific individuals and ask, would you be interested in us experimenting with your school so that we start uploading content here? And, and the moment other schools see that there's a bit of traction uh, taking place elsewhere, then they'll, they'll wake up, right? Uh, it's like the carrot and the stick problem here. Um, I know in our case, the thing that has forced people is this H index thing, right? And very, very soon, uh, uh, Zachary would send me the, the, the policy, finally got Senate approved, and so this is going to force people to start uploading content. So just think of how you can start small, right? And then start uploading content, but also you can take a more targeted approach where you approach prolific stuff that understand this. And I've interacted with a lot of people from CBU that I know are keen to have this implemented. Those that publish a lot of content, go out there and ask, would you be interested in us uploading preprints of your dissertations on the repository? Or could you give us your preprints so that we upload them? Now, granted, as a library, obvious, one of the things you have to do is uh, go through the, the, the tedious process of verifying that uh, you, you actually have rights to upload mm -hmm. preprints because when you publish in, in a venue out there, one of the things you do is you transfer copyright access and some, some publication venues will not allow you to upload uh, bit streams, but you can up upload metadata and point to the original source, right? So, so there's a lot of moving, moving parts here, but policy implementation, um, um, I guess trying to encourage people to, to deposit content, come up with in incentives. The other thing is in the library, if you happen to hold an influential position, or even if you don't hold an influential position, but in these meetings that you have, it's just, just make mention of the fact that uh, we have certain universities that are making progress. If, in fact, new universities that are making progress. Is there something we can do as a library to move forward beyond just having content that was last up, up, uploaded in 2011, right? Uh, in certain instances, it could be that maybe the, 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 the library does, has not realized that this is an important thing to think about, right? Uh, reputation is key here. If I'm a student from Namibia and I want to study in Zambia and I Google up rankings, do you think that I would want to go to university that ranks number 11,000? I'll probably start by looking at the one that ranks number 2,000, even if it's bad, but if I want to study in Zambia, I'll probably look at this, right? You understand what I mean? And part of this ranking is linked to research output. So uh, I don't know, any other thoughts? No, okay. It's, it's a, I, I forgot to, to do a poll, right? Is there anyone who works in a uh, higher education institution other than Chalimbana, CBU, and UNSA? I'm here. Where, where, where is work, Judith? Uh, the Livingston College of Education. Yeah, but I know you guys have a repository, right? We, we interacted last time you attended the thing, right? Yes. But although maybe I, I think it maybe you just haven't um, maybe you haven't explicitly last I don't know if my memory says me right it's not publicly available maybe you haven't carefully thought about what sort of content you want to expose to the outside world or something uh, yeah anybody yeah. else yeah um I'm here I work at Kwame Nkrumah University oh yes are, are we. <laughs> Yeah, we're coming out of the woodwork here. We're coming out of the closet, as the white man says, right? Now, <laughs> are, we, are we making, do we have a repository at Common Corona? No, Doc, we don't have. Are there plans to do this? Yes, there are. We've been engaging ICT, who's been promising to work on it, because apparently okay. we had the dispatch running which uh, just died a natural death. Like the ICT team that was there then, it's yeah. like they left with it. As soon as they left the institution, we had no access to it whatsoever. So we've been trying to talk to ICT to have it revamped. They've been promising to do that, but it's like things are a bit slow. Yeah, now, now you see some of these problems that are coming up, right? Like especially what Cecilia is talking about here is that they'll come up again in module number eight when we talk about library automation and integrated library systems, specifically when you do a comparison between open source software and commercial vision software. You see, this could have been avoided if you paid an external company to say, run 
or manage this dispense for us. And so these are things you can mm -hmm. think about. If you know that your IT does not have the skill set required, then perhaps you're better off having an external company manage the infrastructure for you. Uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, so if, if, you're, if I thought you ever need help, uh, we're always available as Unza, Abel. Mm -hmm. uh, we get points by, by providing community service, yeah. which be community service to help whichever institution is yeah. interested in going yeah, online. Okay. Is there anybody else uh, working for the higher education institution other than the ones mentioned? Yes, Doug. Aha. Where, where is where? Um, I have a, an experience with the Mukuba University. I worked there ah. at one time. Oh, oh, where are you now? I'm now at the uh, Kito College of Education. Okay. Yeah, please share your experience with um, Mukuba. Yeah, please. I think the policy issue is key in yeah. these uh, repositories. Because like... Uh, the situation is, I think it's just the same with CBU, where lecturers were not willing maybe to deposit their papers. So what, I, I what agree. we did, yeah, we just ended up depositing e-books for students just to, for them to use. So I don't know whether that was okay just to get the e-books into the repositories just for students to use. Yeah, well, I mean it's okay, but but effectively what you tend what you you tend the digital library at Mukuba is actually into an open education resource uh, repository or a learning object repository. Yeah, yeah it right? was so just uh, yeah. It, it was just locally. It was just just locally. It was not yeah, uh, deposited yeah. on the maybe to say on the internet for some other people to see from outside, but yeah, it was just is, for. It was just for students for that institution just to use. Yeah, this is this is the thing here. I mean, there's no easy way of doing this, and, and which is why I think Zachary's talk is a must. You probably want to attend this because, in fact, it turns out that uh, when it, when it comes to uh, what do you call this, is it um, coming up with a policy? You don't have to start from scratch. You can literally use uh, the university, the University of Zambia uh, uh, institutional repository policy as a starting point. Right, and then just refine it so that it, 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 it's, it's mapped onto your organization or your institution, right? Um, and people always make mention of the carrot, the carrot or the stick, right? You can, you, can, you can incentivize people to do something by either forcing them, which is a stick, you whip, or you provide the carrot, right? Some sort of incentive to encourage them to, <laughs> to upload. Like in the case of the investors of Zambia right now, uh, I don't know if Adrian is still around, but there's a carrot. The carrot is the H index. People want to expose their work online now because you cannot be promoted unless if you have the minimum threshold associated, the minimum H index threshold associated with the position you want to be uh, 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 promoted to, right? Um, maybe the policy would be the stick where you'd be told to say whatever you publish, you are required to submit something into the repository. Right, so the stick for ETDs would be if you don't if you don't upload your ETD into the repository, you will not graduate. Right, so so there's different ways of thinking about this, uh, and of course this is where Sorry, you no. as experts come in. Yes, yes, uh, but I think that could be different with the uh, colleges of education. Was like uh, if you look at even the lecturers, I don't think they can also be willing to deposit there. Because like the policy for them, I think with universities, maybe it can be okay because they look at promotions, but with the colleges of education, I think it's a different story. Very, very soon, right? Very, very soon it's going to be something that's, uh, I don't know if uh, you are aware that HEA is coming up with, uh, with a policy where promotion is going to be, ooh, let me see here, promotion criteria is, is going to be I don't know where that was from, but it certainly didn't come through email. I don't know if people have heard that HA is coming up with a policy which is supposed to standardize promotions. So if you are a senior lecturer at UNSA, the promotion to senior lecturer should be the same. It should be consistent throughout, right? So 
very, very soon these, these other things, irrespective of the quality of the education, they'll start affecting people working there. So it's best you, I guess, you start thinking about how to prepare. But also, I would like to think, with the Kitwe College of Education, you offer degree programs now, right? Do you Not know? to all the students, but just for distance students, those who've done uh, teaching already. Okay, so but but there are there must there are programs where you offer. Oh, sorry, oh, degrees. Okay, I was, I was no, I was not the program. No, it's not offered okay. there. Okay, I see. I was going to say, uh, what about uploading the ETDs, right? But if you don't offer degree programs, okay. but I'm sure there are people that publish, right? I am. I am pretty sure there are people that publish at these colleges as well. Surely, but anyway. Yes. Um, Yes, yes, Judith. Yes. Uh, with us, we have degree distance. OK. OK. Yes. Do you, have, have you thought about um, about making available those final year project reports? Or you think? They are underway. I think it's just the resources that are limiting us. I see. Okay. OK. Yes. Yeah, I should yeah. share this. I just found the document. I, I'm, I'm going to share this just now. Uh, let me see if I can share this with you, actually. I wonder if I can. Maybe. Uh, let me just see if I can share this with you. Anyway, the, so the HEA is working towards standardizing, um, standardizing, uh, it's working towards standardizing. Um, yeah, it's working towards standardizing the promotion criteria. Um, let me see if I, I wish I could find. It. But any other thoughts or experiences, by the way, before we? Uh, I was trying to see if I can just quickly share this document. Any other thoughts about maybe experiences you've had in the past to do with institutional repositories, or, or if you're thinking of. And it doesn't have to be an institutional repository. Maybe you're working in an organization that you think should be, should be, or that you think should be implementing a digital library that can be used to house anything, actually, right? Could be anything. It doesn't have to be an institutional repository. It could be a document archive. Um, I don't know. Any thoughts about that? Have you? Someone just shared the link. I'm wondering what this link is about. Uh, Hello. Yes, hi. Uh, I think uh, that's the direction in which we are going. You know, it's uh, look yeah. at even the situation that we are in right now, as we yeah. are living right now. I think a digital library cannot be overemphasized. So even in my view, like you were saying, I can just, I think, go that route. Maybe just a small component in that uh, direction, so that maybe when, once it is yeah. feasible, I think others cannot follow follow suit because that's a direction. You know, we, we reach a stage whereby if you walked in the library, like for example, Sydney, the way it was, where it has got uh, maybe a lot of uh, shelves with books, that is not the way it is now, because you find that students just come there for you know for wi-fi okay just a reading space they don't actually follow the books that are there so it's high time we start thinking in those lines by making other uh, information resources at the comfort of their room especially especially when they are connected to the to the to the internet to, to the library so as i change now yes <laughs> Okay. So, yes, so that's, uh, we, we, we cannot avoid that. I think a digital library, is, uh, it's, uh, that's the direction which, which we are going and that's what is everybody doing. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting to hear people's thoughts about all of this. Um, just uh, I'm, I'm having trouble with my machine. I just want to kill some. 
Okay. But again, I'll, I'll stress, uh, by the way, before before the contributions that came through from, from colleagues here, one of the things I was trying to get back to was um, the part of the slide where we, um, where we have uh, those five key aspects associated with information systems. And I wanted to emphasize the fact that the problem is always people and procedures. There's that the bottom, the bottom part of, of those five key elements. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a problematic part. And if you can if you can get that right, if you can get it right, you should be able to to solve this problem associated with. And people have tried self archiving and and all these fancy things, but it turns out that. Uh, the problem is not the technology. The problem has always been, um, the problem has always been people and procedures really. This has always been the, the problem. If you get this right, then um, you should be home and dry. This has always, in, in fact, even the more progressive universities have issues with this, right? Uh, so the, my alma mater, for instance, it's well resourced, but ingestion of content is still done by the library. And this is a progressive university where uh, staff are well informed, but because they are not deliberate policies, and in certain instances, I guess it's ignorance because because people have not been educated on the importance of ensuring that their their output is made available in the repository. We just assume that the library is the one that's responsible for this. So, so yeah. Um, anyway, uh, this was good. I thought very interesting, and I'm sure we'll have a lot more productive conversations very very soon on Monday especially and Wednesday when Zachary and, and company come through. So, so here's the thing, uh, I see it's 2010 and we are remaining with just two, there's supposed to be a practical session, right? A practical walkthrough, but also, uh, I don't know if we can do the practical walkthrough tomorrow, but I also wanted to just give you um, an idea of some of the things that Off-dock. Sorry about that, I lost my connection. Can you hear me? Uh, hello? Yes, we can now. We can, we can. All right. Okay, yeah. So I was just saying that uh, there are just two parts that are remaining, and um, I'm not quite sure how we are going to do this. Uh, the, tomorrow's plan was for us to just try and see if we could attempt some practical walkthrough of this space by using that demo repository. But also there's a part, there's a small little part that's remaining where I wanted to share, um, I wanted to share with you some of the things that, that I have been a part of recently. Um, so some of the things that I, I, I've been working on, research projects that I've been working on, um, and to discuss like places where you can find information about the state of the art. So um, things that are, people are currently obsessing about in terms of research, right? In the event that you have um, plans of carving out your research uh, by aligning it with digital libraries or something, it turns out that there's, there's a number of open, open problems in this particular area, right? There's still a lot that can be done. So two things that are remaining, which, which I think can be done tomorrow. So tomorrow what I'm proposing to do is I'll quickly walk us through some, some things that we have been working towards. Um, and then we'll try and see if we can attempt to do a, some sort of practical session uh, where we get to put to practice some of these uh, things we've been talking about. Just a simple walkthrough of uh, uh, just using this space, if you will, right? So how do we you know, ingest digital objects how do we configure a collection in such a way that it automatically harvests content from a remote repository, for instance? So, so yeah, um, unless if there are any questions, I was hoping that I would, uh, or we would discuss this part here today, but I'm looking at the time, I think we can just move it to tomorrow, I think. Mm -hmm. Unless if there are any questions? No. Or concerns or comments? Nothing. I guess people are tired, right? I see we have two. <laughs> which is normal. Uh, okay, if there are no concerns or comments, then I'll see you tomorrow, uh, same time. Thank you and uh, good night. Thank you, good night.
Thank you, Thank you. Good night. I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, yes, yes, we can. Oh, can you hear me by the way? I don't know, maybe not. Yes, <laughs> they're with you. Uh, hello, people. Before I leave, I want to make sure you heard what I said about our plan tomorrow. We come with laptops, we do a profit call. Is it so? Yes. Uh, I think my connection is bad. Uh, <laughs> let's try and see if I can reconnect here. What that means, sir? Uh, hello. 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 Oh, yes. Hello. Yeah, I, I think my, my connection was a bit bad, is it? You are clear now. Okay, yeah, so I was, I was saying uh, the last bit I was talking about was that the plan today was for me to talk about uh, 6.5, uh, but we'll defer this to tomorrow. And then after 6.5, we will just try and see if we can have a quick walkthrough and play around. All right. Um, with uh, how we get to ingest, how we can configure repositories that automatically harvest data from remote repositories and um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up uh, module number six, um, and then hope that we continue with module number seven at some point next week, maybe Thursday, because we have talks on Wednesday Monday. and Monday. So we might not have class on third. I hope that's fine. Yes. Okay, then uh, unless if there are any concerns or comments, um, I will see you tomorrow then. Uh, I will share this as soon as the video Finishes rendering. Sorry, Doc. Yes. Uh, sorry, Doc. My concern, I think, is uh, from installation stage of this space. I don't know whether you can start from there before right. you start I mean, taking us through yes. the whole display tomorrow. Okay. I mean, we can try and see if we can uh, we can attempt to do the installation. But the problem with the the problem would be that um, doing it remotely. We can try anyway. Okay, we can do that. We can try. That's not a problem. We can, yeah, we, we, we can do that, I suppose. Okay, because That's I think that is the difficult part. Okay, yeah, it, it turns out that it's not yeah. that hard. We can, okay, we can do that. We can incorporate that into installation. Thank you so and much. Let's see if we can walk through the instructions. Okay. Okay. All right, if that's it, then good night and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Joe. Good night, people. Good evening, people. William, how are you? Good night. Sweet dreams. Blessed night. Bye bye. See you tomorrow. Constance. Constance. Hi, Rich. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Fine. Good night. Good night, too. Thank if you. Constance is still here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you must be the only one left. She has dodged. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good night. Okay. Good night, too. See you tomorrow.